Hello and welcome to Books of Blood. My name is John and today I'm going to be bringing you my March uh, TBR, my TBR for the month of March, however you want to say it. I, I don't care. That's okay. Uh, anyway, I thought about actually calling this one my birthday month TBR, but I thought, you know what, I'm not really the kind of person that likes to brag about his birthday and say, hey, it's my birthday month. First of all, I think the term birthday month is kind of ridiculous. It did not take you 30 days to come out of your mama, okay? So that being said, yes, it is my birthday month or my birthday is going to be in March. And I also don't like to brag about it because I think, well, then people expect that they have to send me presents. You do not have to send me presents. Not at all, you know. Uh, cash and gift cards are going to be perfectly acceptable also. Uh, anyway, I'm just kidding. Besides that, or am I? I don't know if I am or not. Anyway, this is my March TBR. I believe I've got 12 books here. Now, usually I just pick out some books at random, uh, including the ones that I do have to review, that people send me for review. Those are not random, all right? Uh, but then beyond that, I don't know what I'm going to read. My TBR is never set in stone. Most of the stuff I get read, but then it's like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to finish this book or not, and I give it to something else, which is exactly what I did back in February, okay? So that being said, let's go ahead and get underway with the the um, review copies that I was sent. Uh, so this fellow here, uh, DH, or excuse me, H.D. Kirkland III, he reached out to me on Twitter, and he said, hey, can I send you my book? And I'm like, Sure. And uh, he wants me to review it. So that's what I'm going to do. Anyway, the book is called Drop. All right. And it says here, fear can incite strange madness and the unknown is a sure way to invite it. And he was nice enough to give me a little signature right here. And uh, there's a little crease or whatever in the page. And trust me, that was not because of me. That was because of our lovely postal system. And uh, the gorillas they have working for them. Uh, anyway, what do we have here? Jacob Kahn lied to his father when he said he was attending a jazz festival in Pensacola, Florida. Instead, he and his closest friends end up in, beside a pond deep in the woods near a long-forgotten cemetery. Whilst that is where their trip began, no one fathomed where their journey would drop them. Drop is a phil philosophical journey into the heart of delirium. It merges colloquial storytelling with the often frantic ramblings of a narrator who questions his every conscious projection. Drop is a psychological thriller told in the vein of Edgar Allan Poe and Stephen King. It imbibes a comical madness while exploring the uncharted abyss of the subconscious mind. It will make you question everything you think you know about good and evil as your perception of reality dissolves into wisdom of nothingness. And that is drop. All right. Okay, next up, and this is from, and I hope I'm not mispronouncing his name, this is from Dimas Rio, and this is Who's There? A collection of stories. A woman went, excuse me, a woman went missing a week before her wedding, a man recalling his nightmarish encounters with the devil, letters sent from beyond the grave, a call from loved ones who since have passed, limbs that have a mind of their own. These ghastly tales of revenge, greed, and desperation writhe and squirm in the dark corners of modern-day Indonesia. Rich in cultural undertones that are uniquely Asian, these stories are in equal part grotesque and poetic, irreverent and spiritual unusual and universal. Drawing on local folk tales of vengeful banshees, dust-dwelling monsters, and other forms of the undead, this collection of five short stories will transport readers to the deep, dark abyss where, demon, where demons forever resides. The human mind. And that's Who's There? Dimas Rio. I don't think he signed this one. I, th I think I ordered... I'm not sure if he, I can't remember. I think he did send me this. Uh, I'm not sure if he signed it. I don't think he did. That's okay. Uh, the stories in here are Who's There, At Dusk, The Wandering, The Voice Canal, and The Forest Protector. All right, so there we go. Okay, uh, last but not least, the last uh, review copy. I got this one from Silver Shamrock Publishing, and I had mentioned that I had wanted to read... 
uh, uh, Keelan, I'm not Keelan, not Keelan, Chad Lusky and Tim Meyer, they wrote a book called Wormwood. They wrote it together and I really enjoyed it. And I said, you know what? I would love to read something else from them, you know, individually. So I, um, uh, Silver Shamrock was actually cool enough to send me a copy of Dead Daughters by Tim Meyer. And is that cover not just freaking awesome? That's by Elder Lemon Design. Yeah, I mean, that's just creepy freaky, all right? Drew Lowry is living the American dream. He has the perfect, fa perfect family, a stable job, and a beautiful home in the suburbs of central New Jersey. Things can't get much better, but what seems like the ideal life is suddenly upended when he receives a blank envelope in the mail. Inside lies a picture of his daughter, a photograph of her violent murder. Only it can't be her. He just tucked her in and kissed her goodnight ten minutes ago. But the mysterious Polaroid is only the beginning. There's the van following his daughter to school. The man she sees outside her window late at night. The fact someone entered her room while the Lowry slept peacefully. Local authorities are clueless. He leads no clues and ultimately no answers. No leads, no clues, and ultimately no answers. Drew launches his own, his own investigation, falling into a hole of lies and deceit, a truth he never saw coming. Dead Daughters is the new twisted thriller from Tim Meyer, author of The Switch House and Kill Hill Carnage. And I've also got The Switch House on Kindle. Haven't read it yet, but I'm going to get to this one first. All right. Okay, next up. And now the rest of them are just ones that I've actually talked about some of these already and some of them I have not. Okay, so this one I have talked about, and this is by Brent Monahan. This is The Bell Witch and American Haunting. I'm not going to read the synopsis because it is uh, what the movie the, uh, and American Haunting was based on. And this is uh, Brent Monahan, his own speculation as to what occurred uh, at that home in Tennessee all those years ago with John Bell uh, and The Bell Witch with Betsy Bell. And if you've not read about the Bell Witch, then just go to Wikipedia, look it up, all right? Because it's really super fascinating. I've been fascinated with the Bell Witch since I was a kid, okay? So I've been reading, uh, you know, try to read as much as I can about her, and this is just another one of those that I'm going to read. So there you go. All right, that's the Bell Witch, an American haunting. All right, from Tony Evans, I've got Sour. And this is another one that is a book about witches. Uh, witches kind of fascinate me in a strange way, all right? I mean, I don't want to be a witch, you know, but they fascinate me. There's three kinds of witches around here that you got to watch out for. There's good ones, evil ones, and ones that sort of just are. Deep in the mountains of Appalachia, a legend is told about something evil that lurks within the dense woods of Gunrack Holler. A witch is said to live there, one whose appetite for innocent souls dates back hundreds of years. Sam Fletcher had heard the story his whole life, but he never really believed it. After all, as his father always said, it's just an old folk tale, only a story. But two years ago, something happened that made Sam question his belief in those old folk tales when he accidentally crossed over into Gunrack Holler and found a small black book with a strange symbol on its cover. The promise to end all of his worries, the prize one that Sam would realize far too late, the loss of his only son, Danny's soul. Now, with the help of his best friend, Sam is determined to get his son back. But to have a chance at reuniting Danny's soul without his body... He is forced to call on an even darker presence, one said to have the ability to resurrect the dead and fix things that aren't fixable. Locals call her the Bone Lady, and they say her power is stronger than Satan's. But dark curses aren't easily fixed, and Danny's body may have already soured, and once they sour, they just don't come back the same. That is Sour by Tony Evans. Another awesome cover. Okay, now this one here, um, the author Wesley South Southard sent me this as a PDF, and I was going to read his PDF, and I was going to review it, that's why he sent it to me, but I don't know what happened, but the PDF just disappeared, so I told him, I said, hey, you know what, I'll tell you what, I'm going to go ahead and just buy the book, that way it'll put some money in his pocket, and and then I can kind of take my time with reading it and reviewing it. But I am going to get to it uh, this month. 
and this is Cruel Summer. That is a creepy looking creature on that cover, all right? Melissa Braun is a broken woman, only wanting what's best for her family. She's willing to do whatever it takes to mend her fractured relationships with her abusive boyfriend. Uh, her, her fractured relationship with her abusive boyfriend. In a last-ditch effort, she hopes the sun and she hopes the sun and sand of a much-needed Florida vacation will bring them and her son closer together. Patrick Braun is a demoralized kid. Quiet and sullen, he only wants his mother to see her boyfriend's torment as it cripples everything he loves. After years of silence, he refuses to stand by and let the abuse continue to tear them apart. Hoyt Rainey is a vile man. Unable to keep his hands to himself, he finally takes his anger one step too far. Only this time he finds himself on the receiving end of his own punishment. Down and down he goes, plunging deeper into the dark blue abyss of the sea. Melissa and Patrick finally believe they are safe. The trouble now behind them for good. They are wrong. God ne gods never really stay dead. They only lie in wait. And when a beast as old as time discovers Hoyt, he too won't stay down gone for long. The nights grow darker. The water grows co flows colder. And the cruelty of summer lives on. And the reason I'm so tongue-tied on that is because reading in the dark, this kind of matches the background or whatever. But yeah, anyway. All right, so in March, um, I believe we are still doing it. Uh, Brad Proctor and I are going to do, this could be my first buddy read. Brad's done a bunch of them with uh, Nerdy Narrative and other people. Uh, but Brad and I have decided we're going to do a buddy read of book number eight in the Splatter Western series from Death's Head Press. And this is The 13th Coyote by Christopher Triana. So starting in March, we're going to read about two to three chapters a day, or time permitting. And then, of course, he and I, uh, Brad and I, will communicate uh, via probably Instagram uh, about, you know, our thoughts on the book. And then maybe I'll do a review on it also. It's supposed to be a werewolf novel, I do believe, set in the Old West. I may be wrong. It may be just shapeshifters or um, uh, skinwalkers, but it sounds like werewolves, all right? An evil is returned to the town of Hope's Hill. When a grave robber unearths the corpse of Jasper Thurston, a piece of the body is stolen, one that will call the coyotes from across the plains. They are a vicious company of outlaws, part madmen and part wolves. Their leader is Glenn the Dreadful, and he's out to gather the power of the Meneer, a particle from an ancient evil. The fate of Hope's Hill, and perhaps the world, rests in the hands of unlikely heroes. A rugged U.S. marshal, a teenage girl out for revenge, an emancipated slave, a nun with a dark secret, and a mysterious half-breed with the number 13 tattooed on his neck. And that is the 13th Coyote, and this is the thickest one so far, man. This is about 400, almost 500 pages. All right. And once again, the awesome cover was done by Justin Coons. All right. So there you go. Okay, uh, next up. From Michael Clark, this is book one in the Patience of a Dead Man trilogy, and this is the Patience of a Dead Man. He'd just spent his last dollar on a rundown house, but someone's been waiting a long time for this day to come. Tim Russell bet everything on a handyman's dream, a quaint but dilapidated farmhouse in New Hampshire. Newly single after a messy divorce, he plans to live in the house as he restores it for his resale. To his horror, as soon as the papers are signed and his work starts, ghosts begin to appear. A bone-white little boy, a woman covered in flies. Tim can't afford to leave and lose it all, so he, turn, so he turns to his real estate agent, Holly Burns, to help him decide whether or not he has any shot at fixing this haunting problem. Can they solve the mystery before he loses his investment, or perhaps even his life? And that is The Patience of a Dead Man, book one in the trilogy. All right. And I probably am going to buy the other two books in the trilogy when I get the money for it. Uh, this one here, I... Not so much that this was a recommendation from Scion Doss, but I read Scion's review, and I thought, you know what, this sounds like the kind of book that I would like to read. And this is by Aaron Beauregard, and this is Yellow. It's a creepy, 
creepy kind of kind of creepy cover. You see something like that. The guy in shadows. He doesn't look quite right. They took his wife. They took his business, but they didn't realize they also took his fear. What would you do if they took everything? Oliver Fitch has a troubling issue. He lives in a state of constant terror. After purchasing a convenience store in a once civil society, the streets around him have, have around him have rapidly developed, excuse me, devolved into utter lawlessness. They're now festering with sinister gutter scum that only live to harass and intimidate him. His pathetic profits are gouged under the threat of violence, and there isn't a damn thing he can do about it. Because in a city with no rules, where the sun never shines, the authorities are no help. In fact, they're an equal part of the problem. The relentless fear of confrontation is so obvious that even Oliver's wife Lydia has grown to resent his spineless existence. The absence of bravado opens the door to a horrific home invasion that leaves the miserable pair savagely maimed. From there, things only get worse until the criminal leeches have taken everything, until there's nothing left inside but hate and the gnawing hunger for revenge, until a switch finally flips and Oliver realizes that they all have to die. And that is yellow. Okay, now this one here. Um, Josh over at Working Man Reads reviewed this book. And uh, I almost got the impression that this one was just a little bit too much for Josh. I mean, he didn't seem too pleased with this book. But he... Uh, yeah, I think it was just one of the, the one of this is one of these books that, you know, it just pushed his limits. And as soon as I when I watched the review and I thought, hmm, I want to read this book. Okay. And I'm talking about Dead Inside. And this is by Chandler Morrison. A young hospital security guard with a disturbingly unique taste in women a maternity doctor with a horrifically unusual appetite. When the two of them meet, they embark on a journey of self-discovery while shattering societal norms and engaging in destructively aberrant, aberrant behavior. As they unwittingly help each other understand a world in which neither of them seems to belong, they begin to realize what it truly means to be alive and that it might not always be a good thing. So here you go. That's Dead Inside, Chandler, Chandler Morrison. Okay, and finally, I've got a graphic novel here. I just got this in the mail the other day. And this is Batman, the Joker War Saga. And not only is that cover awesome, but I'm going to take off the cover and show you the inside of it. On the front cover, you've got the new character. She's the Joker's new girlfriend. This is Punchline. but uh, And she looks pretty interesting, and I've heard some interesting things about her, but I don't know. I'm kind of partial to the girl on the back, and that is none other than Harley Quinn. And this is some really... The artwork on the cover is very reminiscent of the artwork or what you're going to see in the, uh, in the book itself. Basically, what the book is about or what the series or whatever is about, the saga, is how, you know, how the Batman and the Joker have always kind of said, you know what, um, I'm going to do everything to capture you and, you know, and I'm going to put you in Arkham Asylum. And the Joker's like, OK, and I'm going to do everything to make your life miserable and kill everybody, you know, and stuff like that. But neither one of them will kill the other because there's this weird you complete me vibe with the two of them. But that kind of ends uh, because the Joker has decided, you know what, Batman's got to die. And that is pretty much what the premise of the Joker War saga is all about. He does everything in his power to bring down the Batman and kill him. All right. Now, I have not read this series. I'm just telling you this off the top of my head. But that's what I do believe happens in this. And... Um, it runs through uh, quite a few of the Batman books. Batman, Detective Comics, Batgirl, uh, Nightwing, I believe, has a story. Uh, Harley Quinn, I believe, has a story in it. So, yeah, that is it. That is the Joker War saga. Uh, anyway, that is going to do it. That is my TBR for the month of March. Uh, this is going to post on Monday, which I think is going to be March 1st. Yes. So until then, the weekend is going to be coming up. It's Thursday now. So you guys... 
have a great evening and be safe out there. Thanks. Bye-bye.